So in verse 4, it begins a rhetorical question. Uh, Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? The echo, uh, the language here echoes the call of the first angel who proclaimed the eternal gospel in chapter 14. If you remember, it said, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Uh, So do you see the fear and glorify? Uh, It's a call of the eternal gospel, eternal good news, uh, that God has made a, Christ has made a way for all of humanity to do that, to fear Him and to glorif- give Him glory. Uh, but not all turn to Him, not all repent, not all put their faith in Him and come to Him as God. Uh, in verse 4 in Revelation 15, when it says, Who will not fear? In Greek, it's a double negative. So it's very strong. It's basically saying there's absolutely no one who will not do this. So conversely, it's saying every single person will fear, meaning will have a proper view of God, and will glorify the Lord. Their lives will conform to complete obedience. Not everybody is saved, because there's always two groups, right? The righteous and the wicked. The righteous will be glorified. They'll have a loving relationship with with Christ, and their lives will be perfectly uh, in glory, in love. There will also be the wicked who will punished, be punished eternally, as we saw in chapter 14. But they will also have a proper view of God. They will also completely be obedient, although they'll be to- uh, tormented as well. They will no longer be able to sin. So here he's saying, they are singing, who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name. Uh, notice, Here in verse 4, also in verse 3, in the song, it's not just a song about God. It's a song to God. O Lord, this song is sung to Him in a personal way. It's a relational manner. Because God is not some transcendent force somewhere else. He is a personal, relational, loving God. And these people in heaven know him that way. And they are heaping praise because they are experiencing the enjoyment of God in his presence. And just telling them, telling him why he is great. It comes out of the, out of the overabundance of their desire and enjoyment of him and of, of who he is. So, the question, the rhetorical question, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? It's clear everyone will. And it gives three reasons. The first one is, for you alone are holy. Now, this is speaking of the unique holiness of Christ. Now, that word for holy is not the normal word for holy. The normal word is hagias, which means saints or holy. And this is a different word. But that word is used of Christ. It's only used eight times in the New Testament, and in this kind of context, it usually distinguishes that Christ is the Holy One of God, which makes sense because the song is about the Lamb. And it refers to Christ being God's special, unique, distinct, and pure Holy One, apart from all of creation. Now why? Why is that special, unique, well, it's because he is the only one who can reconcile all creation. He's the only one that can make all things right. He was the second Adam. He's the one that was sinless. He was the only one that could make a sacrifice and love creation enough to do so. So that is reason number one, that everyone will fear you because you're incredibly loving and you have, you have loved. Not that he is, but he, he's actually done it and provided a way and thus will glorify you. He, he's earned the right uh, of all creation. Number two, second reason, is for all the nations will come and worship before you. This refers to the promised messianic kingdom. This is a fact of future. God has already said it's going to happen. 
So who will not fear you and glorify you? Because you, God's already said that you were going to be the, the king. You are the king, the chosen king, the Messiah. All of humanity will worship Jesus in Jerusalem. That's going to happen. And then the third reason is, uh, for your righteous acts have been revealed. A righteous acts refers to good decisions, judgments that are publicly made known and implemented in the world. So this whole scene, uh, this whole song, is still in the future, right? Great and marvelous are your works, O God Almighty, the one who will judge evil and bless uh, the righteous. Righteous and true of your ways as a king, uh, king of the nations. You will be the king of the nations of everyone. And everyone will fear you because you are distinct, distinct one of God. And everyone will come and worship you. And, and your actions, your righteous acts and judgments will be made known, period, throughout all the world. It's still in the future. It's anticipatory. So why are they singing it? Well, one, it's as good as happened. And they can see that clearly in heaven. And two, it's recorded for us because it helps us to understand and interpret what's about to come. The coming chapters. It colors everything. Now, why does it cover everything? Why does it color everything? Well, it's because before Christ will be the king of all nations, before everyone fears him and glorifies him and he shows himself to be almighty, he has to do two things, which is to judge the wicked, remove sin, and then bless and restore all that is good and all that is his. Those two things have to happen. So what we're going to read about in the Seven final plagues, the full wrath, is the removal of, the punishment of, so that he can bless and restore. Okay, as a side note here, before we go on, uh, notice these victors are singing the song, right? And notice what they don't say. They don't say anything about themselves, or the way they overcame, or what they used to be, or, or what they are now. The content of the song is completely focused on Christ because their salvation is not their own doing. It's complete work of Christ. Okay, so now the content of that song will be accomplished in the following chapters. But we now need to go to the second and final scene that prepares us for the last uh, seven plagues. And the final scene uh, has two parts. The first one is the seven angels receive the seven bowls of God's full wrath, which is verse 5 through 7. So let's read that passage. It says, And after these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chest with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Okay, so John sees the singing and all of a, all, so, all of a sudden something overpowers it. Something is even, or maybe they finish their song and then they come out. And it's, it's grand as well. And after these things, I, I looked in the, in the temple... The tabernacle of testimony of heaven was opened. So when it says the temple of the tabernacle, we really need to put a comma after temple and say which is. The temple which is the tabernacle which contains the testimony. Now that phrase, the, uh, the tabernacle of testimony, that's a common Old Testament phrase. You might have uh, read it as the tent of meeting or the tent of testimony. It refers to the place where the covenant law of God is kept, which is in the ark, which is in his presence. It refers to God's revelation and his standards, covenant requirements of man and his covenants with man. 
So here, John is focusing on, and I saw the temple, which is the tabernacle of the testimony of the God's covenant in heaven, and those doors were open. Those doors opened. And why were they opened? Well, it was to reveal and to focus on God's covenant. What he's about to do, his bringing about at the end, these seven plagues are to be viewed as a covenant fulfillment. Of what? Well, the promises of a restored relationship, of a new city, of a new creation, to be back to perfect fellowship with God. In order to do that, sin and evil have to be removed. So the doors are open. It also connotes that God is now going to come out. He's going to, the return to earth is now imminent or in the process where he will hold humanity to his law. And thus, the plagues will be the punishment of those uh, on earth who do not partake of the covenant, who have broken the laws of God. They will face their consequences. And conversely, the faithful will receive rewards. So we have seen this description of the temple also before. In chapter 11, at the end of the two witnesses, at the very end of the tribulation, uh, John writes, And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of the covenant appeared in his temple. And there was flashes of lightning and sounds of peals of thunder and an earthquake and great hailstone. Notice the temple. And when it's open, what do you see? The ark of the covenant. It's another way of saying the tent of meeting. That's the place of the covenant of God, his mercy seat, the place of his presence where humanity can come now. Okay, going back to Revelation. He saw the temple open, verse 6, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues. Uh, so the seven angels are coming out of the temple. So they're coming out because of God's instructions. And seven again, number of completion, which John had already told us in the first verse, this is the end, the full. And they're dressed a certain way. For some reason, this is important to John. So he describes it as being linen, clean and bright, meaning they're holy and they're pure. The idea of linen being clean and bright, it, it echoes language used of priestly garments that were made of linen and had to be clean as well. And why? Because they served God. And it, it was a picture of what was going on in heaven. So also, these angels are serving God in his temple. And thus, their actions, just like the priests, are going to be pure and just and right in fulfilling out God's instructions and God's ministry. The golden sash uh, speaks of authoritative status and glorious uh, nature of these angels. And they are given golden bowls. These are sacred objects used for God's purposes. Now, in the temple, in the earthly temple, there was a lot of bowls. Bowls used for incense, which we saw already in chapter uh, 6, or 5, rather, chapter 5 of Revelation. But here, these are different bowls. These golden bowls uh, refer to the bowls in the temple that carry the blood or the libation offerings uh, poured out before God. Uh, they carried liquid. Uh, libation offerings are usually of water or of wine, where they'll be poured out before God's altar. Uh, these bowls are also used for drinking, normally, uh, by, normal, uh, by ordinary people, not necessarily in the temple. Uh, but it's, and because of the normal bowl that's used, and uh, bowls that carried blood or, or wine, it's connected with the third angel's warning to all those who worship the beast, in chapter 14, when he said, And he who worships the beast will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. So it's connected there. Uh, these bowls are connected with the wrath of God that's going to be put upon all those who are not saved, who don't know him. And notice, uh, it describes God, the wrath of God who lives forever and ever, that also is parallel to 14, saying that his wrath 
and punishment will also be forever and ever. Sin is an affront to God and an infinite, infinite God and infinitely more holy than you and I, and therefore uh, his wrath is also infinite. That's the first scene uh, where the angels receive the seven bowls of God's full wrath. Now for the last verse, uh, verse 8, we see the temple is filled with unapproachable glory. Verse 8 says, And the temple was filled with smoke uh, from the glory of God and from His power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Now in the earthly temple and tabernacle, and different points in history, uh, in Exodus 40, verse 34, 1 Kings 8, uh, verse 10, uh, when this, the temple or tabernacle was dedicated to God and God's presence filled it, His glory was seen in the huge cloud that encompassed it. And no one could go in. Uh, and it was sometimes called the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, it, his presence was seen in the cloud, not necessarily a stack, but one that filled it. And also Isaiah 6, verse 4, when Isaiah is in a, he- has a heavenly scene, he's in there in heaven, and God's presence is manifested, Isaiah says the temple in heaven was filled with smoke as well. So the smoke here as well, it's, it's a reaction of God's full glory being expanded, or coming in a, in a different kind of presence, a fuller presence within his creation. And that's what the text says. It's from his glory and from his power. So notice it says, no one is able to enter the temple. Just like when the earthly temples or tabernacles, when God's manifest uh, glory was, was there, no one could go in. Same thing here. And what does it imply? It implies that even the angels cannot handle his full glory. They can't go in at this time. No one can, even the dead saints that are there, uh, the martyrs who are glorified. Once this process of his full glory uh, uh, is manifested in his temple, when the process of him pouring out his full wrath is occurring, it can't be stopped. There will be no more delays. No one can enter to appease his wrath or to make intercession. We saw that in chapter 8, where they prayed, the saints prayed, and the angels added to their prayers, and God gave an additional timing with the trumpet judgments, where we had a third of things going out. Now, there's no longer. No one can come in. And thus, that's what John had already told us in the summary. These are the bowls of the full wrath, because in them, it's over. It's finished. All of his wrath is poured out. And that's the final, final scene. That's the preparation. We have a theological context, which is one of salvation. And then we have the additional scene in heaven where the strong themes of covenant, God is bringing about his covenant promises, but these are also his full wrath that's going to be poured out. His final wrath will be poured out. And there's going to be nothing that was going to stop him. So now let's move to applications. Number one, God's restoration of creation through judgment and salvation is truly beyond our ability to comprehend. Just like John said, they're great and marvelous. In the reconciliation of all things, uh, the wisdom, justice, and mercy of God will be fully displayed to the praise of his glory so that people will praise him for his glory. Uh, But... We should and can and ought to praise him now, knowing that this restoration is coming, and it's sure. This should cause us to praise now. And number two, those who die experience great gain. Those who die in the Lord experience great gain. They are now in Christ's presence, in celebration and song. They now correctly fear him, and they experience Uh, their existence as being fully glorified. And it fully glorifies Him. Their salvation song commemorating their experience 
solely praises the work of the Lamb. Neither they nor we do anything to contribute to salvation. This should cause us to rejoice in the work of the Lamb. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I said rejoice. Number three, fear and glory glorify Christ because He alone is God's chosen means of our salvation. He alone will rule over the whole world in the Messianic kingdom as God has promised, and His rule will be characterized by righteousness. Uh, This week, begin the day with a prayer confessing Jesus as God's chosen King over your life and asking Him to glorify Himself in you now, that day. Number four, in the final judgment of God's wrath against sin, He is fulfilling His covenant promises made personally to us. He will rid the world of rebellion and sin and restore peace and His glory to construct a universe where we can fully know and walk with Him. He is our personal God who faithfully loves us. Love Him wholeheartedly. And that's the preparation for the seven plagues in Revelation 15, 1 through 8. 